Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Escaping Moral Adventure. Today, Mark and I are here to talk with you about storing up treasures. And we'll be the first to tell you we have no clue (laughs) how to navigate this topic or what it should look like. Um, we'll, we'll give more context here in a minute, but uh, just so everyone is aware, we are just literally talking about this today. Would you agree? Mm, yeah. And in fact, if you think about our podcast so far, we don't claim to have all the answers on these topics at all. We are standing on the shoulders of giants who have more to say about this than us, and we try to collect the thoughts here. And this is certainly one of those times we're going to talk a lot about a specific book. I think you'll you'll tell us more about that in a second, Fallon. Our own thoughts and maybe, yeah, challenges and struggles. But yeah, today is definitely a conversation and, and we definitely don't have it all figured out. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and I like that you made that point. We don't have it figured out about any of the things we've <laughs> talked about. So let me start with a scripture. Can I start with a scripture? Yeah, I do? let's do it. Okay, so let me start with a scripture, and this is what our episode is based off of. It comes from Matthew 6, 19 through 21. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And those are words straight from the mouth of Jesus while he was giving his Sermon on the Mount. So I think before we go any further in this, let's define treasure, what treasure means. And I got this definition from gotquestions.com. It says, treasure is anything we value above all else and that which motivates us to action. So in this scripture, it's talking about, you know, earthly treasures and, and treasures in heaven. It, it talks about those um, being different, right? You can't, you can't store them up in both places. And so earthly treasures, examples might be money or power or success, attention or fame, things like that. It could be possessions even as well. So a heavenly treasure then would be Jesus, if, if we want to just encompass all of it in that, is... Um, the heavenly treasure is Jesus. And so when he is our treasure, then we will commit our resources, so our money, our time, our talents, to his work in this world versus using them for our own gain and our own glory. And, and Got Questions talks about that some as well. Yeah, I like the way it defines treasure, anything we value above all else. So it gives us a way to think about it internally for ourselves, right? We can say, well, what do I value above all else? It gives you a sense of where your treasures are. Okay, so I was thinking that maybe we could focus on one of these earthly treasures and just talk about a little bit more. Uh, and I was going to focus on money because that's something that I feel like is pretty important on this earth. Pretty universal. Yes. So is it bad to have money? We're talking about these treasures, right? Earthly treasures and heavenly treasures, and money is definitely an earthly earthly treasure. Well, is it bad to have money? I think we probably need money for some things, so I don't know if you were asking me or not, but I would say it's probably not bad to have money. Did I get that right? You did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so one note here, right? The, the scripture says our heart can't be in two places. Right, let's go back. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you either have treasure in heaven or you have it on earth, and where wherever you have that treasure, there is your heart. So I think we need to ask ourselves, what are we focusing on? Are we focusing on making our life more comfortable here, say by gaining more money, right, to buy more things to make our, our life more comfortable here? Or are we focusing on furthering the kingdom with that money or with our resources and making an eternal impact, right? That Jesus focus, that, that heaven focus. And so I think that's just a question that we should ask ourselves and uh, anyone listening and Mark, you and I as well, Yeah, you know, how are we using our resources? Because you're right. The Bible doesn't say that we should not have money, but it does say that nothing should take priority over the Lord. We see that in Exodus 23 with the first commandment 
thou shalt have no other gods before me. And if money is taking priority over the Lord, then then we're sinning. Yeah. And that's not good for us. That's yeah. not what's best for us. It's sort of that idea, are you worshiping money? And you might say, well, that's silly. I don't worship money. But is that where all of your thoughts are, all of your energy, all of your priority, how you make decisions? Is it all based on that? Then, yeah, maybe you do have another God. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And if I can just kind of like go down this rabbit trail a little bit, why does why does God command this? Why does he say, have no other gods before me? And as I was thinking about this, I started thinking about the char- characteristics of God. I know that he's good, and I know that he is all-knowing, and therefore he would know what's best for us. And he knows that putting him in first place in our lives is what is best for us, and we can trust him in that. Because we know part of his character is also faithfulness. He's His word is his word. It, he's not going to lie. He's not going to go back on his word. We can count on what he says to be true. So when he says, put no other gods before me, we can trust mm. that it's true, that it's good, and and that it's for our – It's he has our best interest in yeah. mind. Does that make sense? Definitely makes clear? sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's the designer. He he designed us a certain way. He knows how we're wired. He knows how we will best fulfill what he has planned for us. And so, yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. So earlier, Mark, you mentioned that a lot of this stuff um, we're talking about today came from a book. And so that book is called True Discipleship by William McDonald. And I'm going to share a quote from there. So, So his thought is is this that you know money or treasure earthly treasure should not be given priority over god but he also had some other things based on scripture that that your money for example should not take priority over or you can well let me just read the quote i'll just read the quote quick uh quick aside yes the book was recommended to you by your dad and so we had a podcast with dad previously yes it was so good we'll link to that yeah but then he also recommended the book. So Yes. Yes. Go listen to that podcast with him. He had a lot of just wisdom in there. Okay. So the quote, it says, a Christian may earn as much as he can, as long as he gives God first place, fulfills his family obligations, works constructively, deals honestly, guards his health and avoids covetousness. And as I mentioned before, all of these points that this book made were are based on scripture. So I thought I thought that was just a good sound bite there, or nugget of truth, if you will, mm-hmm. to kind of help us keep money and wealth in in the proper perspective. Yeah, and maybe one thing when I read that, and when you read the book, it comes across strongly. Avoid using those guardrails. To rationalize your way into thinking why you should, be, why it's okay to keep striving for more, more and more money or doing with your money whatever you you want to, because he kind of goes through and says like, here's what it means to give to God first, and and not storing up treasure in heaven. So yes, fulfill family obligation, work constructively, deal honestly, guard health, avoid covetousness, but don't use those as excuses as to why you keep earning more and more and more and more. Right? Don't say, oh, I have to fulfill my family obligations, which means earn as much as I possibly can now and forever so that anybody in my family will always be set forever. He, in fact, goes into painstaking detail as to why that's not a good idea Mm -hmm. later. So I just wanted to give that call out. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we talked about making sure money doesn't become another god or an idol. So what are some signs that we may have made money an idol in our lives? Yeah, that's a good question. I was trying to think about this, and one of the things that came to mind was if if we're not wanting to give our money away to those in need, or wanting to keep it for a rainy day, or for ourselves to buy more things that we want to have more fun with, I think that might be one example. And then I see I struggle with this because there's there's a there's a line there's a fine line between making money an idol and not does that make mm. sense because is it bad 
to spend money on things that you find fun. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do. I know exactly what you're saying. I think this is a challenge a lot a lot of people have. I mean, it's, yeah. It, and in fact, there's people on all sides of this argument. Yeah. Certainly even within the Christian faith, there's people on, on all sides of this argument. I do like how in this book that you referenced, True Discipleship, he simplifies it by saying, give first to God. Like, that's first. And that's a quick way to check. Am I doing that or not? Like, am I giving first to God? And then, so that's that's an immediate way to, to, to look for that line, right? Like if, oh, my first is always going to the next thing I want to buy. And then if I can scrape together some leftovers at the end, then I'll give it to God. And by giving it to God could mean giving to those in need. The poor could be helping out your church or just someone you know that needs help. That's a great way to know immediately if you've crossed the line. But you're right. Once you... Let's say you do kind of give first to God, then where's that line? I think that's the tricky, tricky yeah. part. Yeah, I think we'll be trying to figure that out for the rest of our days. Yeah, we will on this I earth. Think. I think one thing, Mark, that you mentioned to me as we were prepping for this that the book talked about was oh something along the lines of basically listen to the Lord and yeah. and do what He's leading you to do. Can you yeah touch on that a little bit? I can. I think this was pretty good because he said, hey, how do you make this very practical in your in your life? So how do you know? And to your point, you may not know the exact line. And here's what he said. He said, first, give yourself to the Lord. I, the way I took that is, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you given yourself to God? Have you said, hey, I'm yours and my life is yours? So first, do that. So mm-hmm. take that step. Then... The way he put it, which I thought was interesting, he said, when the Lord puts his finger on various areas of your life, respond immediately. And he he said, you'll know it. Like, is he laying on your heart? Hey, and he gave examples. Are you eating in expensive restaurants? Are you spending money on expensive sports equipment? These are just his examples. How about cars and motorcycles? Do you always want the latest and greatest? Or is there a more modest approach? What about clothes? Maybe you need to change to less demanding employment. What about your home? Is it too expensive a home? And he said, pay attention to how the Lord lays his finger. He said, lays his finger on various areas and then respond immediately. I like the immediately part, right? Because delayed obedience is still disobedience. Yes. And it gives you that time, you know, that rationalization you end up doing. Like, oh, and even he also said, which I also liked, and it goes with the immediacy. He said, pay attention to what the Lord tells you. And of course, by the way, we've talked about this before, it comes from scripture and then, you know, where the Lord lays, what what he lays on your heart, make sure those are consistent, but don't get caught up on what other people are telling you per se, right? Um, so listen to what the Lord has to say. Yeah. Or even what other people are doing, Yeah, I think is important. And I think maybe that book talked about it as well. Yeah. You know, just because the next guy down the street is feeling convicted to, I don't know, yeah. Sell his car or something and get a mo- uh, not a motorcycle, get a pedal bike to take to work. That doesn't mean that that's the same thing the Lord is putting his finger on in mm. your life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And he said, um, he had almost like the flip example of what you just said, which is he actually called it a warning against judging. And he said, let's say the Lord places it on your heart of some of these examples that you need to change in your life because he wants you to give him first. And then you see someone else who's not doing all of those same things. Do not judge them. You don't know what the Lord's placed on their heart. Mm -hmm. To your point, maybe just the opposite example, but yeah. So the scripture is telling us to lay up treasures in, in heaven instead of on earth. And so I thought it might be good to talk about, well, why is it important to lay up treasures in heaven versus here on earth and the 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 first thing that came to my mind was well because they last (laughs) right this earth is not as we know it is not going to be here forever our things are not going to be here forever i mean just think about when someone does die and their their things like they they don't take them with them oftentimes 
they might be divvied up to family members or something like that, but other times they're they're thrown in a dumpster and to just decay and um, and for no one else to enjoy or anything like that. So so that that picture just brings makes me think of how much things don't last on this earth or how unimportant they really are. And then I don't, I'm getting off on a tangent here now, but just kind of checking my own heart a little bit here. But um, storing up treasures in heaven, we should do that because they last. And and also just thinking of Jesus and his example, we see that he gave up his riches, his his glory and his seat in heaven with the Father. He gave that up freely and willingly which is like the biggest and best riches, right? To save us, to come down to this broken earth and live among us. He had no home. He had no place to rest his head, right? They had to scrounge for food, right? And he he did that um, to save us. So then if we follow his example, right, as Jesus followers, this means we should also freely give up our riches. And when I think about, I just, I keep going down all these rabbit holes, but our riches aren't even ours anyway. It, you know, they're his to begin with. So we're not even actually giving up anything at all. I don't know. I'm I'm reminded of how, again, we come back to parenting sometimes and how, what we talk about with our kids. But when our kids are fighting over some toy, it's like, remember who those aren't even ours anyway god gave those to steward for us you know so we tell our kids that and then we get so caught up on what's ours and our riches right um but exactly to your point they're a gift from god yeah for us to steward that's it you know yeah and uh it reminds me of james 1 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change and that scripture talks about all good things coming from the Lord, but also that God is unchanging, which we talked about earlier. We can trust Him and His character and His word. It's going to be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those were a summary, I would say, of the true discipleship and the book teaching, I would say, part one. And then he goes into this part two, which is probably more controversial. So. If that wasn't controversial for you about store, you know, about where your treasure is and how you think about your money and are you making it an idol, part two probably has a little bit more controversial part. And that is he basically makes the case that you shouldn't worry and store up for your future. And you shouldn't provide for your future and the future of your families, which This gets into now controversial, and I would say against every bit of guidance you will get from a financial advisor. (laughs) So, and certainly this is the part that, again, we don't have it all figured out, but I do want to provide a little bit of a summary of his ideas, which I think are useful to at least consider. And he said, when we feel like we're prepping for our future and for the future of our families, we need to prep for a rainy day. What about when we retire? What's going to happen? He had this pretty strong, strong statement. He said, God has been robbed of our life because we're focusing on storing up for the future. And so the prime of our life, God's been robbed of it because we're storing up for our future. And because it's been it's been spent in seeking security where it cannot be found. And his point was, you have no idea what the future is going to hold. You don't know if you're going to be here. You don't know if your money goes to zero in the stock market. You don't know what you're going to need in the future. All you know is kind of what, what are your needs now provide for your family's needs now, then put it, then put the rest to God's work. Cause you know, God's work need is now. Mm-hmm. Right. And so he, that's the strong point he makes. Um, he, so what he says is instead work diligently for our current necessities, serve the Lord to the maximum extent, and then put everything above your present needs into the work of the Lord and trust him for the future. Everything. So put everything else above the present needs into the work of the Lord and trust him for the future. So this is like, whoa, okay. Yeah. You're saying don't build up a 401k. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, did he say savings? They didn't say 401k. I, don't, 401K, I, say, I <laughs> don't recall that he mentioned that specifically, but. but it was in my head for sure. 
he, he gives some pretty strong ideas there. He says, it's a tragedy to give your life to the acquisition of wealth with the hope of giving one's retirement to the Lord. It means giving the best of our lives to a corporation and then the end to Jesus. Even then, the end is so uncertain. Often it's finished before we can get the Bible dusted off. That's what he said. Hmm. So, yeah, he's, he's pretty, um, pretty strong on this point. How do you feel about that? I don't know. <laughs> well, you like security. Like, so this is yeah. tough. He makes a point. You might. He, he kind of goes through other points. Like, oh, well, maybe you think you're storing up wealth for the future for your children. And he said this actually often leads to ruin for your children. They become intoxicated with materialism and pleasure, spilled for the service of Christ. So if you give them a lot of things, maybe they don't learn how to actually provide for their own needs. So they feel like, you know, they don't. So that. Again, he makes he argues against that point as well. Well, I will say, I have heard a couple times over the last several, several years of people saying they are not planning on having an inheritance for their children when they die. So when they die, they will have no money left over to give to their kids. And for the reason you just mentioned, that it's actually not beneficial for them. And the first time that I heard that, I was like, what? I just, I didn't agree with it, or I didn't know if I agreed with it, but it at least made me stop and think about it some. And since then, right, I said that's been a few years ago, I've come to agree with that, that I don't think it's it's in the best interest of our children to have a huge amount of money given to them to do with whatever they please. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And it's not biblical to have no. To, get, you know, to give an inheritance to your kids or anything like that. And and it talks about money a lot in the Bible and yeah. and how it can be a negative thing. Yeah. Yeah, and he also goes on, he said, maybe another argument would be that you're going to give to a Christian organization. So you're not going to give to your kids, your future you're going to give to a Christian organization. He said, there's no guarantee this will happen properly, you know, whether that's through taxes or somebody disputes the money that you've tried to give or that this Christian organization even still does what you expect it to be or is still a godly organization and it lacks scriptural support. There's no scriptural support for such a, such a strategy. He said, the only way to be sure your money is used for the Lord is to give while you live. And this is the only way to obtain future rewards. So storing up treasure in heaven again, and the Bible gives a lot of those like, future reward type ideas right so yeah he makes some strong arguments i would say yes, about this yeah and it's made us think and i think that's an important thing is think about these things seriously intently give yourself to the lord right pray it pray about these yeah. things pray that the lord would show you where he's placing his finger on those areas of your life that you need to make a change in that we need to make a change in you know i'm I'm including us in this mark yeah because it's important it's important to be obedient yep totally agree and his strongest argument on this against storing up this for the future maybe what i thought was interesting he said as christians we're called to be to believe in the idea that the Lord could return at any moment. We look in anticipation at his return, right? This glorious day as Christians for his return. If we really believe that, the only way to be sure that we're maximizing the work that the Lord has laid out for us now is to do it now. Mm -hmm. Instead of some future time, whenever we have no idea if it's, then it might be wasted, right? So just a little thought exercise oh, I'm going to take all this money and then later give more to some Christian organization. Well, what if the Lord comes back now and that could have been used to spread his word now mm -hmm. and to get one more person to know him? Yeah. This might be his strongest argument of the whole book. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. There was a couple warnings. I already talked about one that I thought about. I talked about judging earlier. He had another one that I thought was interesting. He said, a warning to the lazy. This is not for the shiftless or for those who believe someone else owes them. And he uses Second Thessalonians three, six through or uh, yeah six through twelve. He says, "Get out of bed and go to work." That's kind of the the scripture. He he tightens it up into there. 
So he said, this message is for people who are serious, industrious, hardworking, those who diligently provide for the present needs of their family and who first and foremost, for the interest of the Lord Jesus, can trust God for the future. So this message is for people who work hard and are diligent. So, you know, it's not trying to confirm those that want to just live off other people. So he, I liked that warning. Yeah, that's good. I already talked about his warning about judging, and then sort of in summary, he he laid it out. Be satisfied with food, clothing, housing. Be industrious in providing those these current needs for their families. Everything in excess should go to the work of the Lord. Don't try to provide for future security, but trust the Lord. So that's the summary of this True Discipleship book on storing up treasures in heaven. Yeah, good stuff to think about. I have a lot to think about, a lot to pray about. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think look look at this. Do your own research on what other Christians are saying. What other Christian leaders that you trust? So you got to find a trusted Christian leader. What, who do you trust, and what are they saying about riches and storing up riches in heaven? And pray. And yeah, we're still trying to do this too. So good. We'd love to hear anybody's ideas and thoughts on this too. What else do you have for this one? Nothing. <laughs> I need to go lay down. <laughs> <laughs> too much thinking going on? Too much going through your mind? Too much. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope this was helpful in some way. Uh, maybe it at least got you thinking about this as well. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.